Welcome everyone. This is a video that, a TED talk that my student chose actually. I said, what video would she like to watch? And this was a video she chose. It's an excellent video to practice for listening. It's a great TED talk. It's about a fun topic. One thing to notice with the speaker, her name is Miklet Hadero, is how she successfully interacts and engages with the audience. She uses nice, common and easy to understand examples and she draws the listeners into her speech. So during this video, two things are going to be happening. You will see notes drawing to the side as Meklet Hedero's talking. These are Cornell notes. You'll see that straight away now there's a line draws up like that. For a start, as we divide the, the page where we're taking notes into sections, this is a very effective way of making notes. The second thing I'd like to show you here is how well Meklet Hedero structures her talk. You'll hear a nice clear structure where she gives an introduction, three parts in the middle, and a nice summary. It's similar to an essay, but as you listen, just notice there's some things that are a wee bit different in terms of her structure between a written essay and a spoken presentation. So during the TED talk, you'll see me popping up from time to time, and also you'll see these icons. Now this icon means I'm going to ask you to listen or consider something before Meklet Hedero talks, and this icon here will encourage you to listen and consider what she has said after she has spoken. So she will start talking by discussing jazz and hip hop and the 1980s and these influences on her music. Do you think this is important to write down in your notes? As a singer-songwriter, people often ask me about my influences, or as I like to call them, my sonic lineages. And I could easily tell you that I was shaped by the jazz and hip hop that I grew up with, by the Ethiopian heritage of my ancestors, or by the 1980s pop on my childhood radio stations. But beyond genre, there is another question. How do the sounds we hear every day influence the music that we make? I believe that everyday soundscape can be the most unexpected inspiration for songwriting. And to look at this idea a little bit more closely, I'm going to talk today about three things. Nature, language, and silence. Or rather, the impossibility of true silence. Just now, she's given you a very good example of signposting. So she clearly mentions the three things she's going to talk about. She talks about nature, then language, and everyday sounds. So you'll see on my notes to the side here that I immediately use her signposting language to help me take my notes. And through this, I hope to give you a sense of a world already alive with musical expression, with each of us serving as active participants. Whether we know it, or not. I'm going to start today with nature, but before we do that, let's quickly listen to this snippet of an opera singer warming up. Here it is. It's beautiful, isn't it? Gotcha. <laughs> that is actually not the sound of an opera singer warming up. That is the sound of a bird. Slowed down to a pace that the human ear mistakenly recognizes as its own. It was released as part of Peter Zoke's 1987 Hungarian recording, The Unknown Music of Birds, where he records many birds and slows down their pitches to reveal what's underneath. Let's listen to the full speed recording. Now let's hear the two of them together so your brain can juxtapose them. Now, what do you think was the purpose of that connection between the bird and an opera, opera singer. Why did Meklet Hedero use that as an example? It's incredible. Perhaps the techniques of opera singing were inspired by birdsong. As humans, we intuitively understand birds to be our musical teachers. In Ethiopia, birds are considered an integral part of the origin of music itself. The story goes like this. 
1,500 years ago, a young man was born in the empire of Aksum, a major trading center of the ancient world. His name was Yared. When Yared was seven years old, his father died, and his mother sent him to go live with an uncle, who was a priest of the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, one of the oldest churches in the world. Now this tradition has an enormous amount of scholarship and learning, and Yared had to study and study and study and study. And one day he was studying under a tree when three birds came to him. One by one, these birds became his teachers. They taught him music, scales, in fact. And Yared eventually recognized as Saint Yared used these scales to compose five volumes of chants and hymns for worship and celebration. And he used these scales to compose and to create an indigenous musical notation system. And these scales evolved into what is known as kanyet, the unique pentatonic five-note modal system that is very much alive and thriving, and still evolving in Ethiopia today. Now, I love this story because it's true at multiple levels. Saint Yared was a real historical figure. And the natural world can be our musical teacher, and we have so many examples of this. The pygmies of the Congo tune their instruments to the pitches of the birds in the forest around them. Musician and natural soundscape expert Bernie Krause describes how a healthy environment has animals and insects taking up low, medium, and high-frequency bands in exactly the same way as a symphony does. And countless works of music were inspired by bird and forest song. Yes, the natural world can be our cultural teacher. She finishes by saying, "Yes, the natural world can be our musical teacher." This is a really good way to conclude a part of her talk. It's very, very similar to a concluding sentence if you are writing a paragraph. Listen now, and she's going to use some good signposting language to introduce a change and the next topic. What words does she use right at the start to tell you this is the next part of her speech? So let's go now to the uniquely human world of language. Every language communicates with pitch to varying degrees. Whether it's Mandarin Chinese, where a shift in melodic inflection gives the same phonetic syllable an entirely different meaning, to a language like English, where a raised pitch at the end of a sentence implies a question. As an Ethiopian American woman, I grew up around the language of Amharic, Amharinya. It was my first language, the language of my parents, one of the main languages of Ethiopia. And there are a million reasons to fall in love with this language: its depth of poetics, its double entendre, its wax and gold, its humor, its proverbs that illuminate the wisdom and follies of life. But there is also this melodicism, a musicality built right in. And I find this distilled most clearly in what I like to call emphatic language, language that's meant to highlight or underline or that springs from surprise. Take, for example, the word "inde." Now, if there are any Ethiopians in the audience, they're probably chuckling to themselves because it, the word means something like "no" or "how could he" or "no, he didn't." It kind of depends on the situation. But when I was a kid, this was my very favorite word, and I think it's because it has a pitch. It has a melody. You can almost see the shape as it springs from someone's mouth. In de, it dips and then raises again. And as a musician and composer, when I hear that word, something like this is floating through my mind. In de, in de. Or take, for example, the phrase for "it is right" or "it is correct." Lekino, lekino. It's an affirmation, an agreement. Lekino. When I hear that phrase, something like this starts rolling through my mind. Lekino, lekino, lekino. And in both of those cases, what I did was I took the melody and the phrasing of those words and phrases, and I turned them into musical parts to use in these short compositions. And I like to write bass lines, so they both ended up kind of as bass lines. <laughs> Now, this is based on the work of Jason Moran and others who work intimately with music and language. 
But it's also something I've had in my head since I was a kid. How musical my parents sounded when they were speaking to each other and to us. It was from them and from Amarinya that I learned that we are awash in musical expression, with every word, every sentence that we speak, every word, every sentence that we receive. Perhaps you can hear it in the words I'm speaking even now. In this third part of her speech, you'll notice that she starts with an example and then she gives her point. This is quite a common technique in a presentation, but it's something you should avoid in writing. In writing, it's always the other way around, where we will start a body paragraph with the point and follow up with some examples. But a very effective way in a presentation is to switch that around and start with the example. It makes it more fun and it engages the audience immediately. Finally, we go to the 1950s United States and the most seminal work of 20th century avant-garde composition, John Cage's 433, written for any instrument or combination of instruments. The musician or musicians are invited to walk onto the stage with a stopwatch and open the score, which was actually purchased by the Museum of Modern Art, the score, that is. And this score has not a single note written and there is not a single note played for four minutes and 33 seconds. And at once enraging and enrapturing, Cage shows us that even when there are no strings being plucked by fingers or hands hammering piano keys, still there is music, still there is music, still there is music. And what is this music? It was that sneeze <laughs> in the back. <laughs> it is the everyday soundscape that arises from the audience themselves. Their coughs, their sighs, their rustles, their whispers, their sneezes, the room, the wood of the floors and the walls expanding and contracting, creaking and groaning with the heat and the cold, the pipes clanking and contributing. She just gave you a lot of examples, sneeze, cough, do you need in your notes to write down all the examples she mentions? And controversial though it was, and even controversial though it remains, Cage's point is that there is no such thing as true silence. Even in the most silent environments, we still hear and feel the sound of our own heartbeats. The world is alive with musical expression. We are already immersed. Now, I had my own moment of, let's say, remixing John Cage a couple of months ago when I was standing in front of the stove cooking lentils. And <laughs> it was late one night and it was time to stir, so I lifted the lid off the cooking pot and I placed it onto the kitchen counter next to me and it started to roll back and forth, making this sound. <laughs> and it stopped me cold. I thought, what a weird, cool swing that cooking pan lid has. <laughs> so, <laughs> when the lentils were ready <laughs> and eaten, I <laughs> hightailed it to my backyard studio, and I made this. What was the purpose of the cooking pan lid uh, rustling or moving back and forwards? Why did she use that example? Now John Cage wasn't instructing musicians to mine the soundscape for sonic textures to turn into music. He was saying that on its own, the environment is musically generative, that it is generous, that it is fertile that we are already immersed. This last part will have a complex connection between our evolution as humans and our, how music relates to that. I'd like to ask you this question. As you listen to this last part, do you really need to understand all of that to understand her speech? Musician, music researcher, surgeon, and human hearing expert Charles Lim is a professor at Johns Hopkins University, and he studies music and the brain. And he has a theory 
that it is possible, it is possible, that the human auditory system actually evolved to hear music, because it is so much more complex than it needs to be for language alone. And if that's true, it means that we're hardwired for music, that we can find it anywhere. That there is no such thing as a musical desert. That we are permanently hanging out at the oasis, and that is marvelous. We can add to the soundtrack, but it's already playing. And it doesn't mean don't study music. Study music, trace your sonic lineages, and enjoy that exploration. But there is a kind of sonic lineage to which we all belong. Now, notice how she sums up her speech by giving another three examples of her three main points. She will give an example of nature, and then language, and then everyday sounds to finish her speech. This is a really effective way in a presentation. Again, don't do that when you're writing. When you're writing, just paraphrase the points. Don't use new examples. So the next time you are seeking percussion inspiration, look no further than your tires as they roll over the unusual grooves of the freeway. Or the top right burner of your stove in that strange way that it clicks as it is preparing to light. When seeking melodic inspiration, look no further than dawn and dusk avian orchestras, or to the natural lilt of emphatic language. We are the audience, and we are the composers, and we take from these pieces we are given. We make, we make, we make, we make, knowing that when it comes to nature or language, or soundscape, there is no end to the inspiration. If we are listening, thank you. Nature or language or soundscape, there is no end to musical inspiration. And In those eleven words, she neatly sums up her complete talk,、um, and it makes for a very nice, clean structure in her talk. So that's it. Just remember those points from Meklet Hideros. Notice how she had a nice, clean structure throughout. She had three parts. She clearly guided the listener through that. Notice how engaged the audience was. When you see the pictures from the TED Talk of the audience, you'll see that they are very engaged in her talk, and that's often through her use of examples. She gave lots of fun examples that connected directly to her points. So make sure you think about those things when you're giving a presentation. Make sure you notice how we use notes here during the TED talk. This is an effective tool for listening. So there's two things we have focused on here in terms of English: how to structure a successful presentation and how to take notes. Thank you.